Um, well, thank you very much, Diana. And, and thank you, uh, Leslie, and to the organizers for including me in this wonderful, stimulating conference and a rather more two-dimensional paper than, than most we uh, see today, I'm afraid. Um, uh, this is the convent of Santa Croce in, in Florence in an 18th century painting. It was on the eastern edge of the medieval city, but it was at the heart of civic life. The studium of Santa Croce was one of the city's primary seats of learning, where Dante studied theology. And as Julian Gardner has recently reminded us, it was the home of the Inquisition, with responsible, uh, responsibility for rooting out heresy across Tuscany. The current church is the third on the site, one of the largest the Franciscans ever built. The Basilica of San Francesco in Assisi could fit across its transept. The foundation stone was laid in 1295. The transept was roofed by 1310, and thereafter the private chapels strung along the broad eastern end of the top there were decked out with frescoes and stained glass and altarpieces by Giotto and his followers for Florence's richest families, while the nave itself was still a building site. <coughs> the sacristy, the large room highlighted here in yellow on the corridor from the right transept, was built in the next phase, not long afterwards. It served a community estimated to number around 150 friars by the early 14th century. The earliest decoration in the sacristy, as Emanuele Sarpasodi has shown, was the fictive marble panelling with standing figures of saints that can now best be seen on the western wall, along with the three remaining original windows and the entrance from the church. The array of wooden furniture around the walls and in the centre of the room dates mostly from the 15th century, with earlier survivals and later additions. Those covers once held the convent's treasures. The sacristy has had its share of thefts and dispersals, but some of its most prized possessions remain in Santa Croce, such as the crystal reliquary containing the fragments of the true cross. The habit once claimed to be the one worn by St. Francis when he received the stigmata, and the beautiful reliquary of the Beata Umiliana di Certi, a Franciscan tertiary whose cult was assiduously promoted by her wealthy Florentine family, owners of a chapel here. There was also a spine from the crown of thorns gifted by Louis IX of France, a hand from one of the Holy Innocents, and other reliquaries. The relics of Santa Croce used to be a major attraction for pious tourists. They're listed reverently in the earliest guidebooks to Florence, such as these from 1591 and 1754. And they still sometimes make the news today, as when the tuning of St. Francis was laboratory tested and found to be about a century too late. <laughs> <laughs> but in today's guidebooks, the sacristy is primarily noted for its paintings. Documentary evidence about the room is almost entirely lacking due to the loss of the convent's archives in the disastrous floods of 1333 and 1557. But the unusual size of the sacristy, it's the largest in Florence, and its decoration show that this was no isolated strong, strong room, hardly a secret space. Our understanding of the room has in fact been transformed by the realization that it also functioned as the chapter house of the convent, as was first argued by Pavel Voinovich in 2007 and confirmed by a subsequent publication of a document of 1366. It would evidently continue to play this dual role until the building of Brunelleschi's Patsy Chapel as the new chapter house in the 15th century. <coughs> By the 14th century, the chapter house walls of mendicant convents were starting to be treated as mirrors for the self-image of the order, where the friars gathered in chapter could see their own saints and martyrs portrayed around the central image of the crucified Christ. Here, the central crucifixion is by Taddeo Gaddi, who succeeded his master Giotto as, in effect, the official painter to Santa Croce, after Giotto himself left Florence to the Royal Court of Naples in 1328. This crucifixion has been dated to any time between the 1340s and the 1360s, with recent opinion tending to the earlier period. 
At any rate, several decades before the busier and more anecdotal frescoes surrounding it by Niccolo Gerini and Spinello Aretino, which date to the 1390s. As Andrew Laddis pointed out, Tadeo has painted a picture for contemplation rather than a narrative image. Angels form a crown around a cross, collecting Eucharistic blood from Christ's wounds, while John takes the Virgin into his care in obedience <coughs> to Christ's last command. On the right, St. Francis of Assisi and Louis of Toulouse provide a model for the friars in their veneration of the cross. And between them stands the other royal St. Louis, Louis IX of France, whose feast the Franciscans celebrated. At each corner, gesticulating prophets burst out of the picture plane in their eagerness to comment <coughs> on the scene, like over-enthusiastic art historians. <laughs> and little vignettes of ecclesia and synagogue in the lateral borders underscore the message that we are witnessing, not so much the death of Christ as the birth of the church. Funding for the sacristy seems to have come from the Peruzzi family, bankers for the ruling houses of Europe, and already owners of one of the transept chapels painted by Giotto. The Peruzzi arms, golden pairs, appear high in the four corners of the room. It's an irony that the funds confiscated by the Florentine commune from the Peruzzi after their bankruptcy in 1343 were kept in a strongbox in this very room under the eye of the Franciscan sacristan, along with those from the other great banking family and patrons of Santa Croce, the Bardi. Just another indication of how intricately involved the convent was in the civil and not just the religious life of the Republic. The east wall was knocked through around the middle of the century to allow the building of a funerary chapel, initially for the Guido Lotti family. This place, yeah. The operation would have destroyed any decoration in the centre of that wall, and painted figures to either side were subsequently mutilated by the insertion of the large lateral windows, which in their current form date from the 19th century. You can still make out the lower part of a bishop saint under the right-hand window. The chapel walls were frescoed with scenes from the lives of the Virgin and of Mary Magdalene. But the Guido Lotti abandoned their patronage rights before the decoration was finished, and the chapel then passed into the hands of the enormously wealthy Rinuccini family. They installed the splendid wrought iron railings bearing the family name and the date 1371 in gilt letters, and they commissioned the polyptic on the altar, dated 1379. Franciscan saints are, up, <coughs> our Franciscan saints are honored in the chapel as well, St. Francis on the altarpiece and the entrance arch, along with other friars. Here on the right hand side, St. Louis of Toulouse again, and Andrew of Anani, a friar commemorated in Santa Croce after his death in 1302. More Franciscan saints and worthies are portrayed on the main roof beam high above the sacristy, almost illegible to the naked eye. However, for a Florentine chapter house, there's remarkably little visible today that celebrates the life and deeds of the founder, St. Francis. That task, most unusually, fell to a series of small painted panels. Excuse me, let's have a glass of water. These panels are universally attributed to Taddeo Gaddi, author of the crucifixion fresco, but generally dated earlier, to the mid or late 1330s. They show scenes from the lives of Christ and St. Francis. There are 28 of them, most of them now in the Academia Museum in Florence, the ones you see here. The panels were removed from the sacristy in 1810 during the Napoleonic suppressions. The gaps marked the fall that was sold off at that time found their way to Germany, where they can now be seen in Berlin and Munich. Most of the scholarship on these panels has been devoted to reconstructing their original layout. The older reconstructions tried to make them fit onto one large reliquary cupboard, whether single or double-sided. But more recent and plausible ones envisaged the paintings arranged, arrayed in two rows, the Christological scenes above the Franciscan ones 
as the formal relationships within and between the cycles would lead one to suppose, and as they were in fact seen in the 18th century by Giuseppe Ricca. In this format, they're most easily envisaged as part of the spalieri or back panelling above the sacristy covers, as was first argued by Miklos Boscovitz. Probably, in fact, the cupboards that are still there in the southwestern angle of the room, now with patently non-matching and later spalieri above them. The effect might have been similar to slightly later examples, such as these in the Benedictine church of San Miniato al Monte, a short walk away from Santa Croce, and another room, incidentally, which combined the functions of sacristy and chapter house. The half lunettes are now attached together in reverse order, the ascension before the Annunciation. Originally separated, they would have formed bookends to the cycle, probably under a cornice or canopy like the one in San Miniato, as envisaged in the recent reconstruction by Giovanni Giura. The imagery of the panels has received much less attention, with the noteworthy exception of August Rave's PhD thesis published 35 years ago. But evidently the intention was to portray Francis as in some sense the mirror of Christ, as Ricca put it in 1754, lo specchio di Gesù Salvatore. That specularity was sealed into the saint's very flesh by the miracle of the stigmatization, when, in the words of St. Bonaventure, Francis was transformed totally by a fiery divine power into the likeness or effigy of the one he saw, that is, of the crucified Christ who appeared in the guise of a seraph. So the pairing of the crucifixion and the stigmatization was a natural one which had already been made in the famous fresco cycle of the upper church in Assisi, painted in the 1290s. Other parallels, not shown in Assisi, uh, were suggested by the same textual sources. Bonaventure's Legenda Maior made an explicit comparison between the touching of Christ's wounds by the doubting apostle Thomas and the verification of the stigmata on the dead body of Francis by the layman Jerome of Assisi. The luminous central parallel cycle, the seventh of thirteen, combines the transfiguration of Christ with an episode when a globe like the sun on a fiery chariot entered the hut in which Francis's early friars were sleeping. The attitudes of the friars tells the story as it unfolded, from their initial terror on being woken by the blinding light to the subsequent comforting realization that they were being granted a vision of their absent father Francis. And going beyond the text, Tadeo Gadi presents these friars as new apostles, mirroring the three dazzled by the transfiguration of Christ. <laughs> For Bonaventure, this episode revealed Francis as an alter Elias, another Elijah, who was taken to heaven on a fiery chariot, and who it was believed would return to herald Christ's second coming. The typology of this kind could be almost endlessly elaborated, and scenes like these go some way towards justifying the usual art historical description of these panels as showing Francis as an alter Christus, another or a second Christ. This ambiguous, even potentially blasphemous phrase does start to appear at around this time, not in the official Franciscan literature, but in popular writings associated with the fundamentalist so-called spiritual wing of the order. The spirituals made their stand on a rigorous approach to Franciscan poverty, but they were not about making bold and dangerous claims for the apocalyptic role of St. Francis in the coming battle against the Antichrist and his allies, <coughs> often identified with a corrupt and materialistic church. Tuscany was a center of spiritual ferment in the early decades of the 14th century, with distant friars being imprisoned and exiled. In Provence, or were even burned at the stake. Against this background, scholars have sometimes been tempted to see a crypto spiritual agenda in Tadeo Gaddi's Alta Christus panels, not least because two of the leading ideologues of the spirituals, Peter John Olivi and Ubertino da Casale, 
had been influential lectors at Santa Croce in the late 1280s. But those days were long past. And as Sylvain Piron and Julian Gardner again have amply demonstrated, Santa Croce was firmly under mainstream conventional control by the time the new church was under construction. Indeed, the whole project was bitterly denounced by the spirituals as a betrayal of Franciscan poverty. These panels are typologically adventurous, but they're emphatically not a manifesto for the spirituals. Narrative is subordinated to argument in this cycle. Key Franciscan scenes are missing. Others are taken out of chronological order in order to make a point. Here, the maturity is paired with the miracle of the crib at Greccio, when a baby was seen to appear in the manger set up by Francis as part of Advent celebrations three years before his death. Francis is shown twice. Dressed in the deacon's robes, he's reading the opening of John's Gospel on the left, and again on the right, taking the Christ child in his arms, the word indeed made flesh. The miracle has been moved from its original open-air setting into the chancel of a church, and the lay onlookers who were found in earlier versions are firmly excluded. The scenario underscores the theme of clerical orthodoxy that runs through this cycle, appropriate for a by now thoroughly clericalized order. Every friar in Santa Croce could imagine himself at the center of this composition, as the priest presiding at one of the church's many altars, effecting the Eucharistic miracle of materializing the body of Christ. The following scenes take us back into Francis's early career. A star leads the Magi to Jesus, whom they recognize as King of the Jews. Below, St. Peter points out Francis, holding up the tottering Lateran church to the dreaming Pope Innocent III. Next, the submission by Jesus and his parents to the law of Moses in the presentation of the temple is the exemplar for Francis' submission to papal authority as he receives approval for his rule. And the young Jesus astounding the doctors in the temple with his precocious wisdom is echoed by the supposedly unlettered Francis preaching a spontaneous sermon before Pope Honorius III and his cardinals. It's long before the stigmatization, but Francis already displays the stigmata as he did in the fiery chariot. It's surely no coincidence that the feast of the stigmata was added to the order's liturgical calendar as a major or duplex in 1337. But these painful scenes also reflect a relationship that was in need of some repair after the long reign of the French Pope, John XXII, who died in 1334. In his impatience over the interminable disputes about poverty, John had struck at the very heart of the order's ideology. First, he removed the legal basis for the friars' claims to poverty by declaring that they owned and didn't just have use of their goods and property. Even worse, he then declared that belief in the absolute poverty of Christ and the apostles, a belief shared by all Franciscans, spiritual and conventual, was heretical. This was the time of great tribulation, as the Franciscan chronicler Arnold of Saron called it. Even the Minister General, Michael of Chesna, scourge of the spirituals, was provoked into open rebellion against the Pope. By the time these panels were installed, John's more conciliatory successor, Benedict XII, was most probably in office. We've been hearing about both Popes. And both sides were making efforts to restore their previously close relationship. But the order was badly in need of a reaffirmation of its self-identity, its belief that the mission set by its founder remained valid, uncompromised, and within the mainstream of the church. That's what I think these panels represent. The first and last panels of the Franciscan cycle show scenes of renunciation and martyrdom. They're paired with the visitation of Pentecost, images of humility and apostolic mission, respectively. These panels, which are narrower than the others, framed and defined the cycle. In the first, the young Francis makes the decisive choice to renounce his family and possessions, stripping off his fine clothes before his furious father and taking shelter under the mantle of the Bishop of Assisi, poverty embraced by the church. 
boys throw stones at the naked Francis, a display of the world's disapproval. And here, no adults restrain them as they do in Taddeo Gaddi's immediate model, Giotto's fresco in the Bardi Chapel of this same church. In the last scene, a group of friars suffers worldly rejection in its ultimate form by undergoing martyrdom by beheading during one of the Franciscan missions, the missions to the Muslim world that began in the lifetime of St. Francis. The figure in black watching the executions is the Franciscan saint Anthony of Padua, who was inspired to abandon the robes of an Augustinian canon and join the new order by reports of the friars martyred in Morocco. These scenes would have had a special resonance for their first viewers, who might have taken their vows in this very room and whose contemporaries were still being sent to their deaths overseas. Together, these panels offer a vision of the Franciscan mission which begins with the renunciation of secular values but finds its fulfillment in active re-engagement with the world. The journey begun when Francis stripped off in Assisi is a continuing one carried on by the friars assembled in the sacristy come chapter house. It's little wonder that the villain's faces have been scratched out. To conclude, Tanya Gaddi's uh, sacristy panels are a significant marker of a renewed effort by the Franciscans of Tuscany in the mid-14th century, bruised and demoralized as they were by internal splits of papal rebuffs, to glorify their founder as the image and mirror of Christ. Within Santa Croce, they adorned covers that contained the greatest treasures the economy possessed, emblems of, emblems of the cross and the stigmata, contact relics that stood for the bodies of Christ and St. Francis. The panels would have spoken directly and intimately to the friars who gathered here, reassuring them that they, like Francis, were following in the footsteps of Christ. <laughs>